Hi, I'm Jay McClellan, and this is part four of my project to build a travel size uh, backgammon and cribbage board using my CNC router and inlaid with colored epoxy. Uh, in the last three parts, I've gotten as far as making the game boards. Uh, so I've got my um, backgammon and cribbage playing surfaces finished. And if you haven't seen those, you might want to take a look at those. And if you're on YouTube, I'll put a link to the playlist right up here. So uh, go check out parts one through three if you haven't seen them. Uh, in this part four, I'm going to take those uh, game board surfaces that I made and build them into boxes. So I've got to uh, cut them down to size and then uh, cut the wood frame uh, of the boxes, piece it all together, uh, cut some miter joints. I'm going to make splined miter joints, so I'll show you how I do those. And uh, I also have to dye the wood pieces, the wood playing pieces for the backgammon and cribbage to match the colors of the epoxy inlay. I'm going to color the wooden game pieces using this water-based uh, stain powder. The three colors I'm going to use, uh, you've got black and brown, and I'm going to use, this is yellow, even though it looks orange in the powder, yellow, blue, and red. So I need blue and red uh, dye for my game pieces, and then I'm also going to mix the blue and yellow to get green, and I'm going to mix the blue and red to get purple. I've got three ounces of warm water in each of these containers. And to each container, I'm going to add 1 8 teaspoon of dye powder. This is a 1 16 teaspoon measure, so I'll add two spoonfuls of red and uh, two spoonfuls of blue to the other. This is more concentrated than uh, the suggested mix ratio from the manufacturer on their website, and I'll put a link to that in the video description. So my stir sticks also serve as color samples uh, to give me an idea of what the dye is going to look like. And I'm pretty happy with that red. That's a really nice red color. The blue, yeah, it's okay, but it's kind of weak. And so I'm going to add more blue dye to my mixture. So that's three ounces of water with an eighth teaspoon of the red dye and a quarter teaspoon of the blue dye. The blue still looks a little bit weak, but in my experience, it tends to intensify a bit as it dries. So I think that's going to work fine. To make the purple and green dye, I'm going to start with blue in each container and then I'll add red to make the purple and uh, yellow to make the green dye. I'll put the final dye mixing ratios that I used in the video description so you can check that out if you want to see the exact recipe. This dye is water-based so it will tend to raise the grain of the wood. To prepare for this I took the wooden game pieces and soaked them in water briefly and then let them dry out and then sanded them down. So that'll raise the grain once, sand it down, and now it'll raise it uh, much less the second time. I'll start with the red dye. That's a nice concentrated red dye, so they're immediately looking very bright red. The manufacturer says not to let the dye dry on the surface of the wood, but to wipe it down once it's penetrated. So I'm just gonna wipe these down lightly with the paper towel. And now I'll transfer them to a clean paper towel to dry. I also need to dye the cribbage pegs. Now I'll dye the blue game pieces and I can see that after uh, my stir stick sat in the blue dye for a while the blue color seems to have intensified a bit. It's still not a real bright blue but it'll be okay. Well I'm not real happy with the results on the blue. The dye just didn't dissolve real well and I've got a lot of speckles which wouldn't necessarily bother me, but I'm not getting a real nice blue color on there. Here's an interesting comparison. The uh, pieces on the left are the blue ones that I dyed initially and wasn't happy with the results, but I just set them aside to dry. And the pieces on the right are the ones that I just dyed, the second batch. This is dyed with the same dye. It's just that the ones on the left have dried and the ones on the right are still wet. Really looks terrible at first, but once it dries, it comes out a pretty nice blue. My next color is purple. So you can see my checker pieces don't look very purple. They look more of a burgundy color. What I found with this when I tested it is that it gets bluer as it dries. Now we'll dye the green ones. The green uh, doesn't look great right now, kind of muddy. But uh, once again, I think the color will improve as it dries because that blue dye just seems to improve once it oxidizes a little bit. Well, here's the end result after all the pieces have dried, and I'm pretty happy with it. The red is um, maybe a little more pink than I wanted, but I think it'll darken a bit once uh, a clear coat is applied. 
Uh, the blue came out surprisingly good, considered how bad it looked initially. It is a little speckly here and there from some speckles of the blue dye, but it's really not bad, and I think it kind of goes with some of the speckly character in the wood. Uh, the purple is beautiful. Really have no complaints at all about the purple. I think it's just a gorgeous color. Same with the green. Very happy with the green. Again, a few little speckles, I think, from the blue dye, but they go just fine with some of the natural character of the wood. So overall, yeah, I think they're nice colors and uh, they're ready to clear coat. I cut three pair of sides for the three game boards that I'm making, and each pair is book matched uh, so that when it was cut from a board, the saw blade went right down the middle of the pair. So if I open them up, like this, you can see that the grain is symmetrical. And to make the actual boards, I'm going to turn them kind of inside out like this so that that matched grain will flow around the outside of the box. The sides of the box have a notch cut in them to receive the top and bottom of the box. The top and bottom are about three-eighths of an inch wide, but actually a little bit narrower than that now that I've sanded them down. So instead of using a 3 8 inch bit to cut the notch, I'm going to use a narrower bit and cut it in two passes. And I'm going to run each board uh, twice on each edge because these are going to get cut in half to make the top and bottom of the box. Then I'll readjust the router bit uh, to cut the notch the desired width and run them through again so that I have notches that uh, are just a little bit wider than the thickness of my top and bottom boards. I'll switch to a 45 degree bit in order to put a chamfer on the uh, top and bottom edge. Uh, it's partly decorative, but it also serves to uh, break the edge away from the cribbage board side a little bit because I set the holes to be quite close to the edge um, on the long sides. It's already a little bit tight on the inside corners because my pegs have a fairly large diameter head. I'd rather have that than have to make the box bigger and less convenient to carry as a, a travel game board. So now that my profiles are all cut, I'm going to pre-finish the inside surfaces of the sides uh, because it'll be very difficult to finish them after the box is glued up. Here are all my game board parts ready to assemble. I cut the playing surfaces down to their final size, and I miter cut the edges just about a sixteenth of an inch longer inside than, uh, than the top and bottom pieces so that they'll have a little bit of room to float and expand and contract with changes in humidity. As I cut out the side pieces, I gave every corner a unique letter uh, so that I can match them up and don't, think, don't get things mixed up. And if I match the, uh, the adjoining corners, then the grain of the wood is going to flow smoothly across each of the corner joints. Before I glue the corners, I'm going to slightly flatten off the sharp point of each miter. That's going to help me get a tighter glue joint. Now I'll carefully push each joint together and make sure it's aligned really well. And place a piece of tape across and then rub it down really well. I'll brush glue sparingly into each joint. Uh, it's possible to get a stronger joint by first coating it with a diluted mixture of glue and water and letting that dry and then applying the glue a second time so that it doesn't soak in as much the second time. But I'm not too worried about the strength of the joint at this point because I'm going to reinforce it with splines. And right now I'm more concerned about avoiding excess squeeze out into the inside of the box because I won't be able to get to it until I cut it open later. Now that I have glue applied sparingly to each miter joint, I'll set the sides in and then just roll it up around them. Finally, I'll apply glue sparingly to the last corner. And then I'll tape the last corner closed, stretching the tape tightly around the corner, making sure that everything's aligned to get a nice tight joint there. Finally, before I set this aside to dry, I'm going to check that the box is square. And I can see it's not square yet, so I'm going to push on opposite corners. Now that looks good. That's nice and tight. So I've got the boxes all glued up, and uh, I think they look pretty good. These corner joints are strong enough to let me handle the boxes and do some further work on them, but they're not really strong enough to, uh, to survive being, say, thrown in a suitcase or rough handling. So I need to reinforce these corners with some splines. And the splines are just little pieces of cherry that I cut on a diagonal so that I have a flat, uh, a flat end that's long grain. And they're going to be set into the corner like this. And I made, uh, I made a little template of where I'm going to put them. So 
This middle part represents the portion that's going to get cut when I cut the two halves apart with the saw blade to make the top and bottom halves separate. And uh, so I'm going to put a spline here and a spl shorter spline here. I set my fence to cut the innermost of my two slots and adjusted the height of the router bit so that, uh, so that it'll cut the full depth of the slot in one pass. Here's the sled I use for cutting splined miter joints like this. There's not much to it. Uh, it just holds the box in an orientation like this so that I can slide it over the router bit and uh, cut a slot at uh, various depths and various positions. So I've got all my notches cut and already I'm liking the pattern. I think that's going to look nice. And now I just need to glue in all the splines on all the corners. So I've got my splines all dry fit on all of the boxes and now I'll go around and uh, just remove them and glue them in. I let the glue on the splines dry several hours and now it's dry enough to sand down. So the quickest way I've found to clean up these corners is to just run it on this belt sander. And I'm going to use a 220 grit belt, which cuts these down pretty fast, but leaves a nice smooth finish on the sides of the boxes. I'll also round over the outside edges just slightly. I sanded down all of the corners so that they're nice and smooth and the splines look good. So now it's time to cut apart the box halves on the table saw. I set up my saw to cut exactly down the middle of the side of the box. And I'll start by cutting the short sides of the boxes. I cut some thin pieces of scrap wood and I'll tape over the cuts on the short sides of the boxes to keep the whole assembly stable while I cut them apart along the long edges. Cutting the halves apart went reasonably well. I did get a little bit of burning on the cherry, as I expected. I also got some little discontinuities where the blade passed in different directions. So to clean that up, I'll reset my fence just a tiny bit uh, narrower and run these back through. I sanded down the edges of the boxes to clean up all the saw marks and to round over the edges uh, so that it's all nice and smooth and ready to finish. I'll wipe on several coats of clear polyurethane around all of the outside surfaces, all of the bare wood that was sanded down. I finished the remaining surfaces of the box edges with clear polyurethane. So now all of the finishing work is done and the only step left is to install these hinges and a small catch on the front. I'll drill the holes for the screws to hold the hinges very carefully. Uh, number one, to make certain that I don't drill through the wood. And number two, to make sure that they're large enough that I can put the screws in without applying too much torque and twisting them off. I was originally going to make just two, but my test board came out nice enough that I got three complete game sets. Uh, I'll show you how they look inside. Rather than build a board with separate storage for playing pieces that would take more room overall, uh, I decided to package the playing pieces in these little dice bags. So these hold the checkers and the dice and uh, also the cribbage pegs. And I've also got extras of the playing pieces in case any get lost and room for a full-size deck of cards. And the whole thing folds up nice and compactly. Well, I had fun doing this project and I hope you enjoyed it too. Thanks for watching.